This is Ireland, and this is Northern Ireland. In 1970, these fellows in Dublin decided that Britain was cringe, and thus attempted to create an independent Ireland by means of a violent revolution, which failed miserably. However, their deaths made them into martyrs, and thus the idea that Britain was completely cringe went completely mainstream. While the predominantly Catholic South loved the idea of calling it quits on Britain, the North was anything but keen due to the large number of Protestants living there, as they felt they would be discriminated against if they were governed by a Catholic South. Anyways, after two and a half years, 2,300 dead, and far too much politics, it was agreed to partition the island, the Protestant North to the Brits, and the rest to an Irish free state. However, some members members of the IRA were not particularly pleased with this deal, and thus broke away to form the Anti-Treaty IRA, which then proceeded to wage a civil war within Ireland in the name of making Northern Ireland join the side, which failed miserably. But now all the Protestants living over here feel as if all the Catholics living over here are all conspiring to bring the downfall of British control over Northern Ireland, and thus began to heavily discriminate against them. Which brings us to where this story begins. But before we continue, a quick word from the sponsor of this video. My blood, sweat, and tears. Look, there are 66 pages of script for this video. It took far too long to prepare. I've had to reshoot the thing twice already. If you like this content, please subscribe. Anyways, also if you're not from Northern Ireland, here's a list of terminology that I will be using so you can actually understand what I'm talking about. Did you read it? Jolly well, better, huh? Because no. Introducing... Aaron O'Neill! After the end of World War II, he evidently decided that he missed being bombed, and thus moved from his birthplace of England to Northern Ireland. There, he became a Unionist politician, and won the title of Prime Minister of Northern Ireland in 1963. In the 1960s, Northern Ireland was facing severe economic problems due to the prior governments neglecting it. Its infrastructure was marginally worse than this place in Antarctica, the traditional linen industry was dying out, and the shipbuilding industry was... thinking... Due to facilities being outmatched by Sweden, Japan, and worst of all... Germany! To combat this economic decline, O'Neill hired your boy, Thomas Wilson, as an economic advisor. He then published the Wilson Report, demanding massive economic reforms, which were approved by O'Neill. Five new economic zones were established. A new city, Craigavon, was established. Come on, build something. A new university was built in Coleraine. And a few other bits and bobs. On one hand, these reforms were very successful. Michelin, Goodyear, and DuPont were all convinced to invest in Northern Ireland. Motorways, M1 and M2 were built. And an oil refinery was built in Belfast, which, surprisingly, did not provoke an American invasion. Overall, 35,000 new jobs were created, and manufacturing grew by 6%. But that does not mean that all was well. For one, Harlan and Wolf had to be bailed out. Again. <laughs> Establishing a university in the small town of Coleraine, instead of the much bigger South London Independent in Political Affiliation, was seen as controversial, as it was suspected this was done despite the Catholic population of the city. Loser. Companies also refused to open on the west side of the Ban River. The reason they gave was that there was not enough infrastructure. However, it was highly suspected that this was also done despite the population west of the Ban, which was mostly Catholic. Loser. Despite this, O'Neill had been making lots of positive gestures towards Catholics. On the 14th of January, he visited Dublin. In return, he chocolate mass visited Belfast. Many unionist politicians were not very happy with this, one even refusing to attend a meeting with him. You know, is he going to show up? I'll have some patience, he's only about five hours late. With Taoiseach Jack Lynch, he signed a trade agreement and agreed to work with the South to promote tourism. He also did all these other things to appeal to Catholics. And you better read them all, or else I will be very disappointed. Overall, Catholics were quite pleased with his positive stance towards them. And thus, many of them saw this as a good opportunity to end some, if not all, the discrimination happening against them. So, in 1967, a collection of Catholic interest groups formed the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, or NICRA. NICRA made several demands. One man, one vote. Fair allocation of council housing. An end to gerrymandering. And a bunch of other things. So how did they go about protesting, I hear you ask? Well, on the 24th of August, 1968, a protest was to be held from Kildon to Dungannon. To protest a council house being given to a single Protestant woman rather than a Catholic family. Everything was going to plan. But then... 
Leave. So they went home. But if at first you don't succeed, then try, try again. And they were fully prepared to try, try again. And thus, shortly afterwards, they were invited to protest the... <gasps> Dairy Stock on Day, depending on your political affiliations. Corporation's record of house building. In response, the apprentice boys decided to carry out a counter demonstration. Minister of Home Affairs, William Craig, fearing violence, decided to ban both demonstrations. But Nyko didn't really seem to care, and thus went ahead anyways. However, with a slightly smaller crowd. Can you please leave? No. -uh. Okay. <laughs> Get him, boys! Oh, no. oh. <laughs> the police charged the protesters with batons after they refused to leave, injuring many, including MP Jerry Fitt. However, the whole event was caught on camera by an RTE crew present at the event. This footage made worldwide headlines, skyrocketing membership. Then someone had the bright idea. Say, that worked really well. We should get beaten up more often. And this is exactly what would happen. A protest would be arranged. The government would ban it. The protest would go on anyways. They would get beaten up. Membership would skyrocket. Repeat. Catholics and nationalists obviously universally supported the movement. Due to the recent introduction of free education, many of them were now aware of other examples of protests happening around the world at the time. Many had also become disenfranchised with the nationalist party, as it only seemed interested in ending partition rather than fighting discrimination. There's a border there. No, there isn't. Yes, there is. Oh, no, there isn't. Yes, there is. 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 Yes, there is. Also felt they could garner some sympathy from the USA, as the president at the time, JFK, was an Irish Catholic. Unionists, on the other hand, were a bit more divided on the issue. Liberal unionists supported NICRA, as they felt discriminating against Catholics would only make them hate Britain more. The hardline ones felt it was a front for the IRA, which the ultimate purpose of was to unite Ireland. UK Prime Minister at the time, Harold Wilson, was appalled at the violence and demanded O'Neill did something. Thus, a week, two days, and 24 hours after the 12th of November, or some people call the 22nd of November, who knows why that is. He launched the Five Point Program, which implemented most of the reforms NICRA wanted. However, they continued to protest, as it wasn't to be fully implemented till 1971. One other group that was also protesting at this time was called People's Democracy, also known as Smash Dormant. It was made of Catholic students from Queen's University, Belfast, led by Michael Farrell and Bernadette Devlin. They weren't too happy with how long it would take the Five Point Program to be implemented, and thus planned to hold a march from Belfast to Derry to Sunday depending on your affiliation. This was then countered by hardline unionists like Harold Bunting, saying that they would harass the march all the way there, which they promptly did. <laughs> The march started on the 1st of March, 1969, and immediately at both Antrim and Randallstown, they were harassed by loyalists, right. however, were largely protected by the RUC. When the march rerouted from Megara, the loyalists waiting there to ambush them got a bit annoyed, and thus looted the town instead. On the 4th of January, the march was attacked by 200 loyalists in what would come to be known as the Burntold Incident. The RUC offered very little protection, and it was also said that this even happened. I'm sorry, officer, but my head is currently being beaten into the shape of a U. Can I please at least run away? No. Afterwards, loyalists entered the bog side, singing sectarian songs and breaking windows all night. Due to this whole series of events, NICRA began to recruit more Republicans, making it more radical. In response to the whole incident, O'Neill decided that it would be a smart maneuver to describe the marchers as mere hooligans, which, for someone trying to win Catholic support, is a pretty terrible strategy. He later tried to roll this back by setting up the Cameron Report to investigate violence. But the damage was done. Oh boy! How are you doing, old man? I sure love the Catholic nationalist community. How about you? After that, he thought. At least I still have the unionists on my side, right, guys? Turns out, many Unionists didn't appreciate him constantly placating Catholics. And while 27 of 39 Unionists elected in the following election were pro-O'Neill, O'Neill himself was nearly beaten out by hardline Unionist Ian Paisley in his own constituency, only securing 1,400 more votes. There was also no evidence to suggest that more Catholics were voting for Unionist candidates. So my friend, how do you feel about Britain? <laughs> Furthermore, a number of Loyalists, angry at the reforms he did introduce, disguised themselves as IRA men and launched a bombing campaign so they could blame O'Neill for encouraging the return of the IRA. Seeing the writing on the wall, he quit and on the 28th of April 1969 was replaced by Chichester Clark.
Where'd the table go? Anyways, what do you like doing over the summer? Do you go to the beach? Hang out with friends? Or maybe if you live in Northern Ireland, you'll be attempting to get some sleep while some people find it necessary to march around and blast the sash all day from 6 in the morning. And during July, when these parades are typically held, in 1969, they were a hot spot for violence due to their links with loyalists. Police did often try to separate them, but were generally unsuccessful. As a result, seven people would die and 100 were wounded. By this point, the government in London was becoming a bit concerned. Thus set up the Cabinet Committee in Northern Ireland. Dublin also sent an intelligence officer to try and figure out what on earth was going on over there. In the end, they both became very anxious for what would happen as a result of the Apprentice Boys March in the already very polarised city of their South London independent their political affiliations. This was because after the Burnt Halt incident, a new hardline movement was formed. The Derry Citizens Defence Association, led by former IRA volunteer Sean Keenan. It was known that the group was stockpiling petrol bombs in order to defend themselves if there was another loyalist incursion. Micro activist John Hume tried to get Stormont to ban the march. They refused. So on the 12th of August, the march went ahead. And the whole thing went smoothly. Until the very end. At the end of the march, a bunch of Catholic kids decided to pelt the marchers with rocks. Naturally, the marchers weren't too pleased. And thus proceeded to chase them back. Residents saw this and believed they were coming to destroy their homes again. And thus began to erect barricades and trenches. Then, and get the lads, get some petrol bombs and rocks, and start hurling them at the incoming loyalists and RUC members. The reaction by nationalist politicians was somewhat divided. On one hand, you had John Hume. All right, lads, calm down, calm down. Take three deep breaths, in through the nose, out through the mouth. We should be trying to keep the moral high ground here, not beating people on the- Go uh, uh, listen to him! Tear them limb from limb! Rip out their craniums! Here, I'll help you, I'll help you rip up the On the 13th of January, Talk Jack Lynch said, We can no longer stand by and see innocent people injured. This shook many unionists as they thought it was a signal of invasion. We're all gonna die! But fortunately, all he was doing was setting up medical stations across the border. As all this was going on, Nyker saw this and thought, Tear them limb from limb! And thus encouraged all its members to riot everywhere. To stretch RUC supplies thin and prevent any reinforcements to the bog side. When riots broke out in West Belfast, the police responded in the most appropriate way possible for such a situation. Yeah, that's right. I'm a bean gun. Which would result in the death of a nine-year-old boy. Loyalist paramilitaries entered the Falls Road, causing petrol bombs and bricks. As a result, on August the 15th, Protestant and Catholic areas were blocked off from each other by barbed wire to stop them from fighting. This would eventually evolve into the peace wall, which is still seen in Northern Ireland today. Nationalist politicians would stage a walkout from Parliament in protest of the RUC's use of tear gas against rioters in the city that I can't be bothered pronouncing again. The same day, a request for troops was approved. Later, 80 troops arrived in the bog side, and the battle was ended. But that is not the only riot that would happen in 1969, and many more happened after that. Over the whole summer, 10 people were killed, 754 were injured, 16 factories were destroyed, 170 houses were destroyed, 417 damaged, and 1,820 residents of Belfast alone were forced to flee their houses. And while violence was escalating, another group was returning. Prior to 1969, the IRA was described by British intelligence as not organized or equipped enough to play any significant role. They were also noted as possessing one pistol, one machine gun, and a few rounds of ammo. This was because by this point, they'd given up on the whole Irish nationalist thing and become a bunch of commies. Their goal was no longer to unite Ireland, but to unite the Protestant and the Catholic workers of Ireland against the cruel and probably British bourgeoisie to create a united, sovereign, socialist republic of Ireland. Okay, yeah, sounds great. Uh, how are you planning to do this, we though? We haven't quite gotten to figuring out that bit yet. By this point, the nationalist community was getting quite annoyed with them for doing precisely nothing, joking that the acronym stood for I Ran Away. As a result, Colin McStaufen and a few of the lads broke away to form the Provisional IRA. They claimed to defend the nationalist community, win civil rights, bring down storm, and ultimately unite Ireland. They also set up a political party in Finn. The Republic of Ireland's reaction was... We don't like you, okay? You hear that, everyone? Terrorism bad, am I right?
Okay, I think they've left. Okay, so here's what we can do. We've got a few bombs, we've got a few guns here. You know, if you want to go down to the armory and steal a tank or two, I'm really not sure if anyone would notice. There were also plenty of Irish Americans willing to give them hundreds of Armalite rifles to keep them supplied. Many younger IRI members weren't too happy with the older leadership, all being commies. They wanted to fight the Brits, not the bourgeoisie. The thus signed up to the provisional IRA in droves. After the IRA killed several Protestants. Hey, what's that? The government ordered that the Falls Road, a hot spot for IRA activity, be sealed off for 34 hours to allow the army to search for weapons. During this search, the army was attacked by the IRA, resulting in three IRA, KIA, and one run over by an armored car. As a result of this whole kerfuffle, the nationalist community was outraged, resulting in many of them signing up to the IRA. And while the IRA grew, the loyalist paramilitaries were also growing. The UVF had been established in 1966 to oppose civil rights. However, as Republicans became more aggressive, many joined up to defend against the IRA. The UDA was later formed for the exact same purpose, managing to recruit 30,000. However, it also possessed a killing wing, the UFF, Ulster Freedom Fighters, which was known to go about killing Catholic civilians. In December 1971, the UVF would bomb the Grux Bar, beginning the tit-for-tat killings and bombings that the Troubles would become infamous for.